name is Nick Brand. I'm the Director of Corporate Programs at the Chicago Council, and thank you for being here this evening. I'd also like to take this opportunity to welcome Mr. Walter Isaacson back to the Chicago Council. Thank you for being here. I'd also like to thank our partners this evening, the Aspen Institute and CEO Roundtable. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that this evening's session is on the record. So uh, while you are welcome to use social media, we'd ask that you please sign after the program, Mr. Isaacson's recent book, The Innovators, How a Group of Hackers, Geniuses, and Geeks Created the Digital Revolution, will be available for purchase and signing just outside the ballroom, just outside those doors. Our fall program season is starting to wind down to a close, but we do still have a lot of exciting upcoming programs. On December 1st, we're hosting a timely program on the rise of ISIS in the Levant, and that's actually in partnership with the Aspen Institute's Levant program. It includes James Jeffrey, who's the former ambassador to Iraq, Turkey, and Albania, with a great panel of experts, and it's moderated by the council's Rachel Bronson. On December 10th, we're hosting the Wall Street Journal's Brett Stevens with the University of Chicago's Charles Lipson, and they'll be discussing Stevens' recent book on America in Retreat. Moving into the new year, on January 15th, we'll be hosting the New York Times' Roger Cohen, and he'll be discussing Israel, Gaza, and the US-EU divide. I'll return to moderate Q&A this evening, but right now, please join me in welcoming the Chairman of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, Mr. Lester Crown. Thank you very much, Nick, and uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We're just delighted to have all of you here for this session of the Chicago Council. You know you're in for a real treat tonight. Uh, it is a treat any time that Walter Isaacson comes with us. He's really very, very special. Now, any time that, really, that you're supposed to give a historical history of the speaker, you usually take five to 10 minutes about telling people everything they already know and that they don't want to hear anyway. So we're going to dispense at least with that part of him because there are 50 of you in the room that already know all about him. I've had the pleasure of working with uh, Walter at the Aspen Institute really for the last uh, decade, and there's absolutely nothing too complimentary that I can say about him. He's a really a superb, ingenious executive I was going to say with the largest Rolodex, but I don't think anyone knows what a Rolodex is anymore. <laughs> and he, he's almost worn out the contact side of his iPhone as to what is in it. Now, the only thing that exceeds his brilliance really is a wonderful sense of humor. And I assume that uh, Walter tonight is going to talk about his latest masterpiece, The Innovators, and it is a masterpiece. I would like to suggest that if you want to have a collector's item, have Walter sign a copy before you go home. We've been negotiating the commission side of it just before I ever. <laughs> He's written really a number of items, a number of books, all of which are masterpieces. And to me, to have a layman explain the theory of relativity to other laymen in Peter Rabbit English so that you understand is absolutely, truly remarkable. Steve Jobs was on the bestseller list, not for weeks, but for months. But I'd like to recommend two to you, which are really my favorite at this point. One is The Wise Men, which was written back in the 90s, and the other is Benjamin Franklin. And so in the words of local car salesman that you've heard on the radio, you will not be disappointed. He has, as you know, in addition, a full-time job. I don't know when he finds the time uh, to write. I, I really think that he can compose, no matter how complex the subject is, faster than I can read, because the books come out before I finish the previous one. <laughs> but I do want to tell you, he is not perfect. Now, when you talk about the past, and you talk about the men and women that have made history, He's absolutely magnificent. When you talk about things going on in the future, he's really not that great. 
we've had a continuing argument. I was going to say discussion, but it wasn't. It's been argument going on for the past 10 years about things that are happening in the Middle East. And in my opinion, he's never been right. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, because uh, of his superb work habits and everything else, at the Aspen Skiing Company, we have given him a full season pass to all four mountains. The fact that he doesn't ski has nothing to do with the distribution of the past. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Walter Isaacson. Thank you, Lester. One of the reasons I love being in Chicago is all of you are very much a part of a great civic enterprise. It is the most civic-minded city I've ever been to, but if there's one person who epitomizes that uh, in Chicago, it's Lester Crown. His leadership, his values, and uh, his, his intelligence, that's more than just intelligence, because if you're Chicago Council, you know a lot of very smart people, and after a while you discover that smart people are a dime a dozen and they don't usually amount to much. <laughs> what it takes is being wise, and Lester is the wisest person I know. There was a thing incorrect in that introduction. <laughs> I truly have never disagreed uh, with Lester on the Middle East, only I've been slightly more optimistic at times, and unfortunately, because I'm always an optimist that things can work out in the Middle East. I am proven wrong every week. But I will remain an optimist, and someday they'll fool me by getting everything straight over there. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to talk to you about this new book. Despite what Lester said, it's not something I was able to turn out in a couple of years. I'd actually spent the past 15 years working on this book ever since I was the editor of digital media at Time Magazine. I put it aside for a while when Steve Jobs called, but it's something I've been gathering string on for quite a long time. In the early 1990s, when um, I was the digital media editor, things moved from the uh, online world to the internet. In other words, magazines that had been on CompuServe, AOL, Prodigy, got to move directly on to the internet. And my boss at the time, the president of Time, Inc., said to me, well, who owns the internet? And uh, I thought, wow, that's a clueless question. <laughs> he said, well, you know what I mean, who invented the, this is before Al Gore had told us the answer. He said, who invented the internet? Who runs it? Who's in charge of it? And after thinking for a moment how silly that question was, I realized I did not know the answer to it. And this is our revolution of our day and generation. You know, if we're gonna understand America, it's important to understand the American Revolution. Likewise, the Industrial Revolution, we have great books about, or World War II, or the Depression. But our day and generation has had one great historic revolution, and that's the confluence of computers with digital networks that created a digital and information and technology revolution. And basically, most of us, including myself, myself don't know who invented the computer, who invented the internet, who pulled it all together. Now, that's partly because there's no one person, you know, there's no Edison or Morse or you know, uh, Alexander Graham Bell, you can put on a magazine cover. These were done collaboratively. And that, to me, was something else that was interesting as I uh, started researching this. That, as we learn at the Aspen Institute, creativity is a collaborative effort. It's a team sport. And so it wasn't just, as we biographers sometimes distort history to make it seem like you know, we make it seem like there's a guy or a gal in a garage or a garret who has a light bulb moment and innovation happens. In fact, it happens when lots of creative people get together, collaborate, and work together. So I wanted to capture that excitement about what the digital revolution had wrought and who some of these people that, you know, I had not fully heard of were. Uh, I was working on the book when my daughter, uh, Betsy, was applying to college, and she was writing her admissions essay. 
Now, like many of you in this room, my wife and I are the type of parents who kind of hover a bit, and we think we're supposed to help with the college admissions essay. We're at least supposed to edit it or read it. But Betsy is a strong-willed kid, and she was having none of that. So she wouldn't let us even see what she was doing. And finally, she sent it in. And I said, well, what did you do? And she said, I did it on Ada Lovelace. And I said, well, who's Ada Lovelace? I'd only vaguely heard of her. And she said, that's Lord Byron's daughter. And she was the first computer programmer. And I did a bit of a double take that in the 1830s, this woman had come up with the concept of a general purpose computer and computer programming. And as I looked into Ada Lovelace's role, it became sort of the framing device for this book. Because of those of you in this city in particular would appreciate is the connection of the humanities to the sciences, the connection of arts to engineering. That's where true creativity occurs. And Ada Lovelace was Lord Byron's daughter. And being uh, Lord Byron's daughter, she loved poetry. But her mother, Lady Byron, being uh, Lord Byron's wife, was not particularly fond of Lord Byron after a while. He was a bit too much of a romantic poet. So she was a mathematician. This was a long time ago before they told women that they were not good enough to be mathematicians. And so a lot of the great mathematicians of the 1830s, like Mary Somerville and um, uh, uh, Lady Byron, and then eventually, eventually Ada Byron, uh, became mathematicians. So Lady Byron had Ada tutored mainly in mathematics on the theory that that would be an antidote to being a romantic poet. Um, it didn't exactly work because although Ada really loved mathematics, she also loved arts and poetry. And she even saw the connection between arts and poetry and she called it poetical science. And she said that's where true creativity will happen, is those who can stand at the intersection of the arts and technology. It reminded me that that was something Steve Jobs had said to me. On our very first walk, when we were talking about the book, he said, you know, I was sort of a humanities kid growing up. I loved the arts, but I also loved electronics. And I thought that was weird until I read what Edward Land had said, the inventor of Polaroid, that those who can combine the arts and the sciences are those who will be the most creative. So if you've ever seen a Steve Jobs product launch, or you go on YouTube and look at it, it always ends with the street signs of an intersection between the arts and uh, technology. And, she, and he always said, that's where our heart is at Apple. That's what makes us so creative. And so I was inspired by this notion that Ada Lovelace had preached this. She had gone around in the 1830s looking at the uh, weaving machines, the looms that were uh, weaving beautiful patterns in Industrial Revolution England by using punch cards to instruct the machines how to weave the patterns. And her father uh, was a Luddite, and I mean that literally. He, his only speech in the House of Lords was defending the followers of Ned Ludd, who were smashing these looms because they thought they were putting people out of work. Back then, people feared that technology would put people out of work. They were wrong then, just as they're wrong now when they think that, and Ada did not think that. Ada looked at the way the punch cards were making those weaving machines do beautiful patterns, and she applied that concept to a friend of hers named Charles Babbage, who was making a numerical calculator. And the numerical calculator used punch cards to do numbers. And what Ada wrote in a published scientific essay, which was somewhat unusual for women to be published in scientific journals, she wrote that with the punch cards, this calculating machine could do more than numbers. It could do music. It could do anything that could be noted in symbols. It could do words. It could do patterns. It could do art. In other words, she came up with the concept of the general, interest, uh, the general purpose computer. And she even gave an example of the type of instructions you would give a computer using punch cards to make it do specific tasks. Step-by-step -step instructions with embedded loops and you know, some, you know, the type of things that a C++ coder today would say, oh yeah, that was clever, that was a good hack, I get what she was doing. She was able to publish the first computer 
program. She did have one caveat, however. She said machines will be able to do anything except think. They will never originate thought. They will never have imagination. They will never be creative. It will take the combination of humans and machines to apply the creativity to the technology. And the technology will augment human imagination, and human imagination will augment technology, and there should be an intimate partnership, she said, a symbiosis between humans and machines. And that becomes the next theme of the digital age that I sort of helped, you know, I was helped to understand by Ada Lovelace, which is that the great narrative of the digital age is our machines become more and more personal, more intimate, more interactive with us, instead of this notion of them being robots or artificial intelligence off somewhere else trying to replace us. Because the two strands of the digital revolution are the Ada Lovelace strand and somebody who came 100 years later who to me is one of the most brilliant, interesting people in the computer revolution, and I really wanted this book to help make him more famous. It's Alan Turing. Now, since I wrote the book, a new movie has come out and Benedict Cumberbatch is playing Alan Turing, so I think he's doing 10,000 more things for the, you know, he's doing 10,000 times as much for the reputation of Alan Turing as I'll ever do. But it's been fun to watch the reaction to this movie, because the movie is called The Imitation Game, and The Imitation Game is based on a paper that Alan Turing wrote in response to what Ada Lovelace wrote 100 years earlier. Alan Turing was a great mathematician in England. He built upon Ada Lovelace's concept of the general purpose computer to have what he called the logical computing machine, a universal machine that could compute any logical sequence. He comes up with that when he's in his young 20s, the whole mathematical formal concept of how a certain type of digital machine could do anything that could be done notated logically, building on Ada Lovelace's idea. And then, of course, he goes to Bletchley Park, England, and helps build the machines that break the German wartime codes. But right after, he writes this paper about the imitation game, and the section on the imitation, uh, the imitation game is called Lady Lovelace's Objection. Because what he's doing is trying to disprove what Ada Lovelace had said, which is that machines will never think. Machines will never be creative. And he said, how would we know that a machine couldn't think? And that's what the imitation game is. You put a machine and a person in a different room, he said, and you have a machine programmed to imitate a human being. And if after a while you're sending in questions and you can't tell what's the machine and what's the human being, then there's no reason to say the machine isn't thinking. Now, you can argue with that. In fact, it is the most argued uh, concept in cognitive uh, theory and philosophy, which is consciousness, and whether or not such a machine that could be mistaken for a human would actually be artificial intelligence or human. But leave aside the philosophy. The interesting thing to me is that Alan Turing said, of course, we'll soon have machines that'll be able to do it in a few decades. But it's been, uh, what, 65 years, and we still don't really have machines that can fully pass the Turing test that can be confused for a machine. I can take out my Siri and talk to her for a little while on my iPhone, but I'm pretty clear after a moment or two that I'm not talking to true intelligence. And every year or so you read, uh, except for maybe in the fantasy movie, but every year or so you might read that some machine has come along and passed the Turing test, and it's always some gimmick that for five minutes it confused a few people into thinking it was, in the latest case, a Romanian boy who didn't speak English well, or whatever. But the interesting thing is that the combination, as Ada said, of the human humanities, the human imagination with machines keeps getting stronger and stronger. Alan Turing's great machine at Bletchley Park in some ways was the first electronic computer called Colossus. But it was not a general purpose computer. It was designed only to break the German codes. And so when you ask the question, as I try to in the book, who really invented the computer? There's really two possible answers. And that also gets into the notion of collaboration and teamwork 
versus a lone genius. The lone genius in this case is a guy named John Vincent Adanasoff, who at the Iowa State um, was working on a computer, and he came up with all the rudiments of how you would make an electronic circuit using vacuum tubes, totally electronic, to be able to do all the logical things that Turing and Ada Lovelace envisioned. But he was a loner. He was the type of person who took long drives in his Oldsmobile every night to think. Actually, he also would go to the Illinois border where you could buy liquor by the drink, which you couldn't do in Iowa, and that would help him think too. And he would come back and tinker on this machine, and he almost had it working. But since he was a loner, he only had one graduate student working with him, he couldn't quite get the punch card burners to work, he couldn't quite get the machinery to work all that well, and after a while he goes into the Navy in 1942, and nobody can figure out what this contraption is in the basement, they kind of forgot what he was trying to do, and they dismantle it and throw it away. It would have been forgotten by history were it not for somebody at the other extreme, somebody who's very much of an Aspen Institute type, in fact, he was. John Markley used to hang around the Smithsonian and the Carnegie Institute. He loved going to meetings. He loved going to gatherings where people shared ideas. He was the ultimate in the collaborative scientist, somebody from National Geographic Association. He was always at all these meetings sharing ideas. And um, he kept wanting to come up with ways to build the great computer. And so he travels around. He travels around to Dartmouth, where he sees the Stibbets computer that had been built. He goes to Harvard, where Grace Hopper and uh, Howard Aiken had created the Mark I machine. He goes to the 1939 World's Fair, and he picks up ideas. And eventually, he stumbles across the, uh, this guy, John Vincent Adanasoff, who's building something in Iowa. So Mockley gets into his car with his nine-year-old boy and drives for four days to Iowa State to go look at this machine and visit Vincent Ananasoff. And he spends days there, picks up all the ideas. As you might imagine, those of you in the room who are lawyers, this leads to a 17-year um, intellectual property lawsuit. <laughs> but uh, we don't let the lawyers, we amateurs and uh, technologists and we historians don't let the lawyers decide who invented the computer because after 17 years, they still couldn't figure it out, and nobody got the patent for the computer. Uh, for us, it's the type of people who drive around from place to place and pick up ideas like a bumblebee picking up pollen and cross-pollinate and then actually execute it that deserve the credit as the person who invented the idea. So what Mockley does is he comes back to the University of Pennsylvania, and he builds not a computer at first, but a team because he knows he needs a collaborative team, people can do everything. So he gets Press Eckert, a great engineer whose grandfather had made Turkish taffy machines. He gets a whole lot of mechanics. He gets uh, information theorists from the University of Pennsylvania, a team of 80, 85 people, including six women, not very well known to history, who were great mathematicians, so that the machine could be reprogrammed. It was their job to understand the hardware of the machine and how you would give it new instructions, how they could be the modern day Ada Lovelaces by writing the programming for the machine. And after a while, they finally get that machine working, and it's ENIAC, and it's general purpose, electronic, it does missile trajectories, but the women have found ways to reprogram it so that when John von Neumann and others from the University of Chicago came because they were trying a new type of atom bomb test, it could be reprogrammed to do the atomic bomb test. And it was all done in secret, which is why you haven't heard of some of these people. But they did finally unveil it publicly uh, on Valentine's Day of 1946, once the war was over. And in that great unveiling, Jean Jennings, who was the lead woman programmer, wrote a whole set of programs for the demonstration. And let me for a moment take a detour just to tell you about Jean Jennings, because I think it's important, uh, especially here in Illinois, other places that are wrestling with higher education. Jean Jennings was one of nine children from Alanthus Grove, Missouri, a tiny, tiny town of 104 people. And when she was growing up, she was the only girl in the family, and she decided she wanted to be a mathematician. And so she went off to Northwest Missouri College, a small college, 
and was able to major in math. She paid a total of $72 a year tuition and becomes the mathematician who programs this machine. I actually went back to the website of Northwest Missouri College, is now $14,000 a year. And I do worry we're losing whole generations of people like Gene Jennings who can't quite afford college and won't be plucked out uh, based on merit the way she was. Something else happened that was a, um, when they finally unveiled the machine. As I said, it was Valentine's Day weekend, the New York Times, Washington Post, Boston Globe, Chicago Tribune, lots of newspapers are there. It's on the front pages of the papers, this great demonstration, new machine built that can think. Um, but after they did the great demonstration for all the dignitaries in the press that day, and all the military brass from Washington. They went to Houston Hall, the grand old hall at the University of Pennsylvania, for a candlelight dinner. But they didn't invite the six women programmers. They took the bus back on that cold Valentine's Day night to their apartments in Philadelphia. And it was really the beginning of women sort of being written out of the history of technology, even though they have made great contributions. Those six women, despite the fact that they weren't invited to the dinner, all six of them went to work for John Mockley later when he turned ENIAC to UNIVAC. Actually, one of them, Kay Mockley, married John Mockley. The other five worked for him as programmers. They recruited Grace Hopper from Harvard, who had done the Mark I there. They invent the programming languages like COBOL. But it's still, to me, one of the things that struck me in the book was the important role women played back then, how little credit they've gotten in history, how few role models they have. And in fact, when I told you about Betsy, my daughter, telling me about Ada Lovelace, I said, why were you interested in Ada Lovelace? And you know, she's a computer geek. She loves math. She said, well, I wanted to be a computer programmer. But up until I discovered Ada Lovelace, the only woman I had ever heard of who programmed computers was a character in a Batman comic. And so this notion that there aren't role models can sometimes be problematic. In fact, when I went to college, um, approximately 30, 35 percent of the people studying computer science in America at college were women. It's now 17 percent. It's gone down by half. So we're losing half the population as being uh, you know, part of this revolution. And I hope that more attention to these women programmers will help change that. Anyway, the great uh, ENIAC that they invented was a pretty important machine. But it wasn't a machine that fulfilled Ada Lovelace's vision in that it was not easy to connect it personally. These were big, hulking devices the size of maybe that edge of the room. It would take up a whole room uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. And it wasn't very interactive. You had to send in your punch cards. It would do batch processing. What makes machines personal and intimate, the next step, is this idea of interactive computing. And it's done by another Missouri person, also lost to history, I think it was really cool, named J.C.R. Licklider. Now, Lick Licklider was an aw shucks Missouri guy who loved giving credit more than taking it. And it was part of that uh, three-way combination that the University of Chicago, other places were, right after World War II, in which the government, research universities, and private corporations all worked together to do basic research, something that we've lost a bit today. And so Lick Licklider was at MIT. He joins Lincoln Labs and a private company called BBN, working for the government and these companies and for MIT. He's there to develop the concept of an air defense system. Now, if you're creating an air defense system, you need a con it needs to interact instantly. You can't wait for it to batch process when the missiles might be coming in. So he really makes fast interactive computing. Secondly, he does something nobody had thought of much before, which is to have a graphical, easy-to-read screen so that you could feel personally, you could understand the machine right away. 
with, you know, little blips going across, and you could tell a pigeon from a passenger plane from a missile, which was also quite important uh, for a console jockey to be able to do. And thirdly, he realized that he would have to network these around the country with the other research centers and the other air defense systems. So being kind of a clever, funny guy, he calls it the Intergalactic Computer Network. But when he does his turn in government, as all these people do, they go in and out of government uh, back then because it was a noble thing to do, he goes to ARPA, the part of the Pentagon, and he calls it ARPANET, and he funds it, and it becomes the backbone of the Internet. It was particularly interesting to me researching how that Internet came to be because it was another example of where collaboration not only leads to innovation and creativity, but it leaves an imprint on the innovation itself. What happened was, after Lick Lick Lighter was there at the Pentagon, and they're funding this uh, network for great research uh, universities to share, um, they decide that they have to write the protocols, the way it's going to work as a packet switch network. In other words, how the packets are going to be broken up, what size packet will a message be broken into, how do you put a dress header on in the front of the packet, what, how does it recombine when it gets to the destination, all those magical things that make email work in a packet switch network. And being great research universities, they do what professors at great research universities do. They delegate this task to their graduate students. So a whole bunch of graduate students decide, first of all, let's have a party. Let's get together and meet in various places. They decide where they're going to meet every six months, and they decide to start writing the protocols or the rules of the road for what will become the Internet. Now, um, being very collaborative, they kind of worried that at some point the people from the East Coast, either from MIT or from Washington, D.C., would come tell them how to do it. But in the meantime, they decided to share, in a collaborative way, the invention of the Internet. And they wanted to make it so it wasn't like they were handing down rules. They didn't want it to be top-down authoritarian. So what they did was they came up with a name for everything they came up with. There was a guy named Steve Crocker, the youngest of the bunch, another of the heroes of this book. But Steve Crocker said he was standing in the shower for you know, almost an hour, because it was the only place where he could think. And he was trying to figure out how can we make these proposals or these rules for the internet very collaborative. What can we call them? I don't want to call them the rules or the instructions or the protocols. And he finally comes up with calling them requests for comment. It's such a cool little phrase. Because every time they'd come up with some idea, like here's how we'll do the address header on a message, or here's how a packet will be stored and forwarded as it goes through a packet switch network, instead of saying here's a way to do it or here's a proposal, they would just write it up and they'd say request for comment. And everybody got to do it collaboratively, open source, just like Wikipedia and some of the great open source products, projects. Now, uh, when I was at Time Magazine, as after this was done, we wrote a story that said the reason the Internet was done in this incredibly decentralized way, with no central hub like the phone system would have, or even regional hubs the way an airline might have, instead, every single node on the Internet has equal power to store and forward packets of information. And we wrote that that was done so that it would survive a Russian nuclear attack. Because if you have a hub, the Russians can take it out, and our communication system is destroyed. We got a letter from Steve Crocker, somebody I didn't know back then, but this is how I first heard of Steve Crocker, said, no, 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 I was the person doing these things. We didn't do it. We didn't care. We weren't trying to do it to survive a Russian attack. And he asked for a correction in Time Magazine. Time Magazine back then was somewhat arrogant and wrote back saying, no, we have better sources than you. I remember that. And so when I was doing this, I said, hey, don't I remember this? And I got somebody to look up the files in the Time Magazine archive so I could walk the cat back. And I realized, OK, the better source was a guy named Steve Lukasich, who had been deputy to Lick Lick Leiter and had succeeded Lick Lick Leiter in running ARPA at the Pentagon. So I called him up, and he said, yes. Uh, at the Pentagon, we were actually funding it, partly for that reason. That was why the colonels wanted it. And that's how we got the money out of Congress. As we said, 
this network is not just for a whole lot of, you know, research assistants sharing things. It's to survive a Russian attack. So you tell Steve Crocker, he said, he knew Steve Crocker, tell Steve Crocker that he was on the bottom, but I was on top. So he didn't really know what was happening. So I went out and had coffee with Steve Crocker a few weeks later, and I said that to him, and he nodded for a moment or two, and he said, you tell Steve Lukasich that he was on the top, and I was on the bottom, so he didn't know what was happening. <laughs> and in some ways, that sort of exemplifies the bottom-up, collaborative way the internet was created, and that is imprinted on everything the internet does. It is very much an open and collaborative effort. In fact, even now, to answer my boss's question that I began with, which is who runs the internet, who controls it, it's still being controlled by what's called the RFC process. Thousands of requests for comment that are just done collaboratively without one person saying, okay, here's the way we will do it. Now, even after the ARPANET and the internet come along, you don't fully have the vision that I've been talking about of connecting humans to computers in a deep, personal, intimate way. Partly it was because even after these big computers that Lick, Lick, Leiter and others did, and ENIAC and UNIVAC, computers weren't personal. They were um, big old costly things that the Pentagon or the, you know, the establishment and corporations got to have, but not ordinary people. Partly that was technological. Um, until Intel comes up with a microprocessor, it's kind of hard to build a cheap, small, portable machine. But also it was cultural. People thought at DEC and IBM, you don't need a personal computer. Nobody's going to want their own personal computer, and so they don't pursue it. But there's, uh, we were talking about it, the Chicago Tribune was, you know, you were asking me about, you know, why does it happen in Silicon Valley? Well, in California, Northern California, in the late 60s and early 1970s, you have a confluence of different types of people. And they all come together to sort of create a fertile territory for the invention of a personal computer, a computer you could have on your own instead of share in a corporation. First of all, you had a lot of the hippies, the uh, electric Kool-Aid acid test types. Ken Kesey, who was doing the demonstrations of the electric Kool-Aid acid test. Uh, you also had the free speech movement and the anti-war protesters. You had the communitarians, people who thought they were going to live on communes and were reading the whole Earth catalog once too often. And, uh, you know, with the access to tools being the mantra of the whole Earth catalog. You also had community organizers who wanted to take power to the people, take power back from the corporations of the power structure and give it to the people. And they created something called the People's Computer Company, which was basically just a newsletter, but it said computer power to the people was a subhead of it. And you also had hackers, electronic geeks, you know, just total whacked out hippies who listen to the Grateful Dead once too often, but love that sort of uh, sound and light shows. And they all wanted their own creativity devices, personal computers. And so by the late 1973, when the Intel 8088 microprocessor comes out, it's suddenly possible. And boom, it happens as if you know, there's a ferment, and it finally becomes, you know, a, a place for new life forms. And then the hobbyists start creating personal computers. The first one was probably the Altair. It really didn't do much. It had a whole lot of lights on the front and toggle switches. But it was a personal computer, and people went nuts over it. It went on the cover of Popular Electronics, the January 74 issue. Uh, which came out in mid-December of 73. I was at Harvard at the time, but I was at the wrong place at the wrong moment at Harvard because there was another guy there, a year younger than I, or two years younger, uh, Bill Gates, who had convinced a friend of his named Paul Allen to drop out of University of Washington and just come hang out with him in Cambridge. So Paul Allen is walking by the um, Harvard Square, that out-of-town news kiosk in the middle of Harvard Square, sees Popular Electronics with uh, the Altair on the cover, saying the world's first personal computer is the headline. 
plops down his 75 cents and jogs all the way to Courier House through the slushy snow and throws it uh, down on the desk of Bill Gates and says, this revolution is happening without us. Bill Gates did something I did not know you could do when I was a student, which is he blew off all four of his exams, he dropped all of his courses, and for seven straight weeks, he and Paul Allen used the university computer to program BASIC for the personal computer. And uh, BASIC become the, the, the version of BASIC that would work on an Intel 8088 personal computer. And they go down and they are able to convince uh, Mitz, the maker of the Altair, to use it. And they go on tour with the Altair. And the Altair comes to the Homebrew Computer Club. The Homebrew Computer Club at Palo Alto, you can tell by its very name, is where all of these tribes get together. The hippies, the hackers, the free speechers, whatever. And they believe in the Homebrew Computer. They uh, see it. They do something particularly true of hackers and geeks, which is they believe all software should be free, so they steal a copy of the basic tape that Bill Gates had produced and make 70 copies of it and give it away for free, thus leading to a classic letter, Bill Gates' letter to the homebrew hobbyist, saying you're stealing, you know, software is not supposed to be free. It's the first great conflict between sort of the open source model versus the proprietary software model, a struggle that's been very useful to the whole ad the growth of computing, because neither side is fully right or fully wrong, but the tension, the dynamic, uh, the dialectic between the two has, cre has created great things. But another thing happened when that computer was at the Homebrew uh, Computer Club meeting is Steve Wozniak who uh, worked, uh, had dropped out of college, was working on little TV monitors and things. He's there, and he sees it. And um, he says, wait a minute, this machine is really lame. I mean, it just blinks lights. I can make something better. You know, I can make it so it will connect to a TV monitor with a keyboard. You can actually do things on it. So he goes home, and he sketches it out, and he does it. And he's got a friend who works the night shift at Atari, doing video games, named Steve Jobs, and he convinces Steve Jobs to come with him to the next meeting of the Homebrew Computer Club so that Steve will carry the TV set. And they do, and they hook it up, <laughs> Steve carries the TV set, Waz shows off how it all works, and Waz was in that homebrew hacker mentality. He starts giving away the spec sheet for his computer. And they even do it at the, second, the next meeting of the homebrew. They're giving it away for free until Steve Jobs finally says to him, wait a minute, we can go to my parents' garage and we can make these things in the garage and we can sell them. And thus, in that few month period, in that very fertile territory around the homebrew computer club, you have the birth of Apple and the birth of Microsoft. And uh, it really does help bring computing power to us all. The final act in all of this is uh, back in 1993, 94, which is when I first started interviewing all of these people, because I was doing new media, gathering string for this book, met all the people who were involved and said, tell me your story, tell me your story. And in that period, normal people could not really go on to the internet. In fact, at Time Magazine, we were putting us, us stuff on AOL and CompuServe, as I said, and it was illegal if you were just dialing up to AOL or CompuServe to actually go directly onto the internet. It was all, you had to be at a research institution with access to the internet. To give Al Gore his due, had he spoken more precisely, his great contribution is the Gore Act of 1992 and then the Gore Act of 1993, right, as he becomes vice president. And it has many things in it, including the creation of these research center networks that would all tie together. But the main point of it is it opens up the internet to everybody. It makes it not only legal, not only is it not illegal to let people on the internet, you had to, by law, open up the internet. So anybody who wanted to dial up could just get on it. And that is a pivotal point in the digital revolution. And it's indeed when, you know, people like myself and others are working at magazine companies, publishing companies, other things, and we help create 
websites. Tim Berners-Lee had created uh, the World Wide Web that very year. I mean, it really becomes popular. He invented it in 1993, just as the internet is opened up by the Gore Act. 1994, Mark Andreessen comes up with the Mosaic web browser. So suddenly, we not only have access to the internet, we meaning us ordinary folks, but we have good ways and cool ways to navigate it. We made a couple mistakes, uh, bad mistakes, when I was running uh, digital media for time. First of all, we put them all, all our stuff online, and advertisers were so eager to buy banner ads and stuff, we decided we were going to be ad-supported only, give away the content for free in order to get eyeballs for advertisers. That was not a sustainable business model. Journalism is um, still trying to recover, put that genie back into the bottle. But the other thing we did that was somewhat um, a mistake, I think, is that we poured old wine into this new bottles. For example, we would take our magazines, our newspapers, and just dump the pages of our magazines online as websites. And up until then, when we were on CompuServe, Prodigy, AOL, most of what we did was form communities, you know, virtual communities. There'd be discussions and bulletin boards and chat rooms and virtual auditoriums, and everybody would talk and we would discuss things. Uh, once we went directly onto the internet and the World Wide Web in particular, comments were relegated to the bottom of the story. Nobody really read them, and we were made it into a publishing medium uh, as opposed to a community formation medium. But uh, one of the rules of the digital revolution is that the street finds its own uses for things. It's a cyberpunk maxim that Bruce Sterling and others have written about. Basically, what it means is that, you know, when we create things, the street finds a way to say, we're going to use it for what we want. As Aristotle taught us in our very first Aspen uh, seminar, uh, uh, man is a social animal. So we're going to try to create social community things. We were not doing that when we first put our publications online. I don't know if uh, Joan Hall is here. Is she? Oh, there you are. Okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this, all right? So, jo most of you probably know Joan Hall. So, I'm there in 1994 or so, and i um, running digital media for time with clueless bosses, and I'm thinking how clueless they are, and some kid with very long blonde hair, who's a sophomore at Swarthmore, I think, then, arrives named Justin Hall from Chicago to tell me that we at Time Magazine are actually clueless in what we're doing. <laughs> that we're just publishing things on the web, we're publishing our magazine, instead of forming community. Instead of making this something that you can, ordinary folks can control, make it personal for them. And he was doing a whole lot of links from the underground, but he also kept a log on his web page of everything he was doing. You know, the girls he was dating or the girls who wouldn't date him, pictures of himself in various stages of undress. I won't go into it too much since his mom is here. But trust me, as she knows, it skirted the line between, you know, being really fascinating and too much information, right? <laughs> but that was the whole point of it. In fact, he even wrote about too much information. That's how we capture the technology back for us. We give too much information. And so he became almost a Johnny Appleseed, going around not only to Time Magazine, but around the country telling the people to keep web logs. And they started to. And web logs became a big deal. And soon the word was shortened to just be blogs. And suddenly, the internet was not owned by big corporations like Time Inc. It was blogs. It was people. Anybody who wanted to could connect to it. And so that was one of the final things that helps make this whole technological revolution power to the people, a way for people to be more connected intimately to their machines instead of the machines to be detached from them. In other words, it was connecting our human creativity and our imagination to our technology the way Ada Lovelace said, as opposed to the notion of Alan Turing, that we'd have artificially intelligent machines that would be machine learning and work without us. Now, I'm not knocking artificial intelligence or machine learning. It's a very important thing. But it is not the true narrative arc 
of the digital revolution. The narrative arc of the digital revolution is people like Justin Hall and Steve Jobs and everybody else taking the technology and connecting it to us more personally, putting it on our wrists so we're doing Apple Watch or in our eyeglasses or in our laptops or in little tablets or in our pocket so that we can interact personally and intimately with our technology and make it a social networking technology, not something of artificial intelligence. Every now and then people say, yes, but the great advances were kind of artificial intelligence, like, you know, Wikipedia now knows more than anybody could. Well, a couple things about Wikipedia. I think it's great, but it's not like Wikipedia knows this. Wikipedia is simply the ultimate of what Ada Lovelace talked about, which is combining human creativity with computing power. Taking a wiki software that allows people to collaborate online and gather the wisdom, the intelligence, the imagination of millions of people to a crowdsourced thing. So it's humans and technology creating a Wikipedia. That notion of crowdsourcing always, you know, fascinated me. Right after I finished Einstein, early in the 1990s, just as Wikipedia was, you know, gathering steam, I was such a geek that I was one of those people who was on Wikipedia, editing, contributing, doing things. And I looked at the Einstein entry, and it was really good except for one thing. There was a sentence in it that said, in 1937, Albert Einstein secretly traveled to Albania so that King Zog could give him a visa to escape the Nazis. Everything in that sentence is incorrect. Um, so I took the sentence out, but it kept reappearing in Wikipedia because, you know, very partisan Albanian pride nationalists they could always point to some website in which some uncle said that on the streets of Tirana that one of their cousins met Albert Einstein, who was secretly there getting a visa, and so it would reappear. And I would then put something in saying, no, he was actually in Princeton that entire year. Here's, you know, the publications from that year. He had a Swiss passport. He never went to Albania in his life, but it would still reappear. <laughs> then finally, one day after all this struggle, it ended up not being in the article anymore. And I did not, of course, attribute that to the wisdom of crowds. I said, man, the crowds, you know, weren't wise at all. They had it wrong. It was me. I fixed that. It wasn't the wisdom of crowds that fixed it. And then it finally dawned on me, since um, Lester has uh, quite politely given me the virtue of humility, which my friend Dr. Franklin said he could never master. But uh, it slowly dawned on me that it wasn't me who fixed it, that I was simply part of the crowd. I was just one of many, many people adding my little bit to the crowd, and there was the crowd who fixed it, but I was part of that crowd. Likewise, people sometimes say, well, Google, you know, you can just ask Google anything, and it sort of almost like the Turing imitation machine. You can, I said, no, not quite. You can ask Google a really tough question, like what's the depth of the Red Sea? And it'll come back instantly with the answer, whatever it is, you know, 5,427 feet, something even your smartest friend doesn't know. But you ask Google a really simple question, like, can a crocodile play basketball? It'll have no clue. <laughs> it might give you the Florida Gator schedule, I mean, whatever, but it ain't going to know what you're talking about because it doesn't think. It's not creative. It doesn't have imagination. And secondly, what it was wasn't like Google has gone out or the Google web crawler went out and found information. What the brilliance of what Larry Page and Sergey Brin did was not to have a web crawler that found information, but have a web crawler that went and found the links that millions and millions of you know, people put on their own website and to combine the human creativity with the computer processing power like Wikipedia, like Google, like Ada Lovelace said, with the difference engine. And so that, to me, even today, is still the theme of the digital revolution, connecting the hum humans to technology in a symbiosis more intimately, which means connecting humanities to engineering, humanities to science. And as we talk, those of us who are involved in school reform or whatever, about the importance of STEM education 
It is totally important that kids learn science and technology, engineering and math. But what we're bringing to the party in this great symbiosis of Ada Lovelace is we're bringing the moral judgment, the artistic sensibility, Steve Jobs' idea that beauty matters, which is why the iPod is beautiful. We're bringing the arts and the humanities because it's the arts and the humanities that teach us creativity and even moral judgment. So it's very important in education, not only to create a new generation that can do technology, engineering, and math, but a generation that has a true appreciation for whether it's uh, Plato's maxims or all the things that happened in the Industrial Revolution that understand art and history so that we can play our role of connecting our moral judgments and our humanistic sensibilities the way Adel wanted to our machines. However, and I know most people would agree with that, one reason I wrote this book is I think the converse is also true. People like myself and perhaps like many of you in this room who love the arts and love the humanities and go to the Art Institute and would be appalled if somebody said, well, I don't really know what a Picasso is or why it's so important. And would uh, you know, be, think somebody was a Philistine if they said, well, I don't know the difference between Hamlet and Macbeth. But they might joke, they might even brag that they don't know the difference between a gene and a chromosome or the difference between an integral and a differential equation or that they don't know the difference between a transistor and a capacitor, or how a semiconductor actually makes an on-off switch, and that allows it to do logic in a circuit. Those are pretty tough concepts, but Ada was able to master them, and I don't think she found them any harder than mastering a line of her dad's poetry. She could visualize it. She could visualize her father's poetry, take a line, you know, she walks in beauty like the night, and Ada, that's a tough line. It's hard to know it, but you can visualize it. And likewise, she could visualize an algorithm, how you instruct a logical process, how a mathematical equation is just the good Lord's brushstroke for painting something beautiful in physical reality. So what I hope to have, uh, you know, sort of preached a bit in this book is that it's important to love the beauty both of the sciences and of the humanities, and to be somebody who can help connect them. We do not want to cede that intersection to just the engineers, nor do we want to be uh, engineers who have no sense of beauty or no sense of the moral judgments that have to come in creating our technology. So I think it's important to be like any of these heroes in my book, from Ada Lovelace to Steve Jobs, from Lick Lick Lighter, who used to go to museums and just spend an hour looking at each brush stroke to figure out how creativity worked and then come back and do it in his computer engineering. All of these people who made that connection, because those who feel comfortable with both the humanities and with the sciences, they're going to be the ones like Ada that will lead us to the next stage of the revolution. Thank you all. And uh, we'll now go out to the audience. If you can please raise your hand, wait for a mic, and please ensure that your question is a question. Yes, uh, right here in the middle, the uh, gentleman with the, uh, the black sweater. Is that you? Yes. <laughs> right. uh, the mic's coming to your left. Thank you. Would you comment on the book Singularity and the ideas behind it? Yeah, the notion of the singularity, and I hope you have people here who will uh, talk about it. Um, you know, it was invented... Uh, early on the concept by John von Neumann, which is to describe the moment at which computers will not only be more intelligent than humans, will be able to create even more intelligent machines that could leave us behind and we aren't going to be important. Whether it's Bill Joy writing about it or Elon Musk or, you know, people like Ray Kurzweil who for the past 40 years have always said the singularity is 10 years away, but it keeps getting... Those are the people on the other side of the case that I was making who keep saying that the advances will come when machines do things without us as opposed to us being combined with our machines. 
And there was those two schools of thought I mentioned, the, what I call the Turing School or the Lovelace School. Doug Engelbart was part of the uh, Lovelace School, and he comes up with the opposite concept of the singularity, which is the complementarity, the notion that machines and um, humans working together will augment, the augmentation of each other will always be more powerful. So let's take a couple of examples, such as Deep Blue, which uh, wins at chess against Kasparov, or Watson, who beats Ken Jennings at Jeopardy. Both of those machines now, instead of being used to sort of create a singularity, uh, Watson is now being used in tight collaboration with doctors to do cancer diagnosis. Because what IBM in its cognitive computing division, which they renamed the Watson division, discovered was that the combination of human judgments and you know, various things that humans could bring, doctors could bring to the party with machines kept outperforming uh, machines alone and machines trying to teach machines to do it alone. Likewise, Gary Kasparov, who was beaten by um, Deep Blue, uh, created a new contest in which a human and machine could work together and play chess against uh, either the greatest grandmaster or the greatest supercomputer. And every single year, even an amateurs using laptop computers can beat the best grandmaster or the best supercomputer doing chess. Now that won't always be the case because chess is, an, is a rule-driven algorithm game, but still it shows that if you really want to make progress, aiming for the singularity or worrying about the singularity, with all due respect to Elon Musk and everybody else, is probably not the biggest worry we face now. I have at the end of my book the people starting to talk about the singularity in 1957 when the perceptron comes along. And the New York Times writes that the perceptron will mimic the human brain and within 10, 15 years will be able to leave humans behind. Every decade since 1957, the New York Times has done a story saying in 20 years, neuromorphic chips will lead to this and it'll leave people behind. As Lick Licklider said after a few decades of this, Maybe they'll someday be right, but in the meantime, let's do that symbiosis, that partnerships of humans and machines, because it always seems to be a mirage that's always at least 20 years away before it happens. Uh, I will come back in 20 years with Ray Kurzweil, and we'll see who turned out to be more right, and I will admit, admit that I'm wrong if the singularity has occurred. All right, next question, please. Uh, Yes, the, uh, the young person over there with the, uh, the, the white shirt, please. You're giving your mic runners a workout. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, so you mentioned earlier in your presentation on technology that um, you believe, uh, like, you, you will believe that uh, we will achieve true artificial intelligence. Do you think, sorry, do you think that can happen uh, without the aid of humans, for example, uh, Currently, we are seeing that programs are trading with each other um, in the stock market, whereas 30 years ago, it used to be stockbrokers. Yeah, it's not done very well, by the way. Um, well, as I said to the previous question, I'm always surprised at the amazing leaps that happen when you create a partnership between humans and machines and the amazing lack of progress you have when you rely on machines alone. Um, uh, let me go back, if I can, to the imitation game and to Alan Turing, because he was somebody who believed, like you said, that we might have artificial intelligence. When you watch that movie, or preferably even read the chapter on Turing in this book, you'll notice that in some beautiful and tragic way, his life may be the best refutation of his theory that machines alone will be indistinguishable from humans. Because he was gay, um, he was not ashamed of being gay, but it was not something you could be very public about when you were in British military intelligence in the 1940s. Um, but after he wrote the imitation game paper, saying 
And I think it may have been partly as he wrestled with who he was, he wanted to believe that all humans were pre-programmed, that we were just the same as machines. And yet, you watch his creativity and his genius, but also his impulses and desires, and you say, that's not a machine. And right after he wrote that paper, he was engaged in a debate over the question you asked, and he was also engaged in a set of activities that were so human that a machine would have found them incomprehensible. He had met a 19-year-old young man, drifter, in Manchester. Uh, he had had the man move in with him. He got burglarized. When he reported to the police, he uh, said, you know, he, he admitted that he had a sexual relationship with a young drifter. And he was sentenced, uh, because it was then illegal, to, uh, he was sentenced to be um, almost pre reprogrammed. He was sentenced to take um, hormone treatments to try to change him from having these desires, these human urges. And he went through a year of hormone treatments as if he were a machine that could be chemically reprogrammed. And um, he took it in stride for a while, but then in 1955, he takes an apple, he dips it into cyanide, he bites into it, and he commits suicide. In some ways, the imitation game was over. At that point, we knew Alan Turing was human. It's not something a machine would have done. So I think we have to look into ourselves and not try to picture ourselves as machines because it's just not true. Yeah. All right, uh, next question, please. Uh, yes, uh, the, the gentleman right here in the, the green sweater. What's at stake in the debate over net neutrality, and yeah. where do you think, what do you think the outcome will be? Yeah, net neutrality is a somewhat complex issue, because the less regulation of the internet, the better, is one theory I have. But secondly, we don't have a lot, I believe in the best way to get out of this problem is to have more competition and choice. The problem right now is your internet access you don't have a whole lot of choice. I don't know about you, but you might have the cable company, maybe a phone company, you know, but not, not much choice. In Manhattan, I only got one choice, time on a cable, because the building is time on a cable. So when you do not have competition and you don't have a whole lot of choice, it is not good, I come from the content side of this business, so I'm slightly allergic to it, to have the people who own the pipelines have too much power over deciding who gets, whose content gets distributed. And uh, that, to me, is what is at the fundamental heart of net neutrality. I don't want Time Warner Cable saying, you'll get Netflix better than you'll get Amazon or NBC. You'll get NBC, because we actually own, you know, if the Time Warner Comcast merger goes through, but, you know, we're not going to allow this on. And they say, well, we can overcome that by having a lot and a lot of rules and regulations that say they can't favor NBC over ABC. And I say, fine, but what happens when the next Vox or the next Huffington Post or the next Vice comes along? You can't have regulations that say, here's how you have to treat things that haven't been invented yet. What happens when Twitter is combined with a video service and you can tweet videos or something? There's not something I think has happened yet, but you know, you don't want them to have to make a deal with Time Warner Cable or whoever the cable provider is or who the phone company in order to have the access they need. So net neutrality says everybody gets access to the pipes, just like everybody gets access to the phone system or to the highways, and you know, there's, the phone system can't say we're going to favor this type of content. As I say, that opens up a bit of a can of worms, but I'm in favor of net neutrality. I hope, uh, and, I'm in, and so I think Obama did the right thing, um, pushing back hard against the cable companies. I also, and this will get me in a little bit of trouble, worry about all these mega mergers, because if a Time Warner Comcast cable company uh, has 30, 35% of the national market, and I'm CNN, let us say, uh, I can't afford to lose a battle with them over how much they're going to pay or what split we're going to get in the revenues. 
Uh, why? Because I'm toast, whether I'm CNN or anybody, Netflix, Amazon. So they will have more power in their negotiations with content players. And that, to me, will stifle innovation. Because if you're really big in your ABC and you got ESPN, you can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with that conglomerate and say, you need ESPN, so put ABC on. But if you're Vice or you're Huffington Post or you're somebody new, you don't have the power to say, you got to give me carriage, both on cable TV and on the internet. So until we have, the goal would be to have great market competition. There are many ways you could do it. You could open up the spectrum so that there'd be 20 different ways to get broadband access into the home. You could turn the last mile of fiber into a public utility and have different companies connect to it. But the real problem, the reason it's almost a monopoly or a duopoly is you can't you know, have people tearing up the sidewalks, putting fiber uh, from the curb to the home. Uh, you know, dozens of competing companies do it. It's like electric wires. You want it to be a utility. I'm not a pure expert at it, but I don't want the big pipeline owners to be the ones who control which content gets uh, carried. Great. We have time for maybe one more question. We've I'm sorry. taken uh, a lot of questions. I'll do real fast. <laughs> I'm sorry. You can do a couple because I, I feel guilty here. Taking a lot of questions from men this evening. Are there any women in the audience Way that have any questions? There. Way back there. Yes. All right. I, I can. I know people want to go. I can do a couple more. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll take two, oh, two yeah. more questions. Yeah. Yeah. In your book, you spend quite some time developing the personalities of each of the heroes and heroines that you talk about, yeah. um, talking about their upbringing, their childhood. In your research, and as an entrepreneur, I'm curious, did you find any themes that you noticed in the innovators? What led them to take the chance and innovate? Were there personality characteristics that stood out to you? Yeah. Well, the first part of the answer is that there's no one formula, which is really good, because if there were, Instead of having us, you know, historians and biographers, you could just have those people who write the books, you know, the seven secrets to innovation or the formula for creativity. And I think different people do it differently. You have to look inside yourself and say, what's my way of doing it? I mean, Steve Jobs was a really commanding, strong, tough perfectionist. But his mentor, Bob Noyce, who created Intel, was about the sweetest, nicest person in the world. Nobody ever called Steve Jobs the sweetest, nicest person they ever met. So there are different ways of doing it. And you have to say, I know what my leadership style is. I'm going to pursue it that way. But there are a few commonalities. And it tends to be that people who are great innovators question received wisdom. They sometimes question authority. They don't take uh, things on authority. They're a bit of a rebels. They run away. In fact, every person I've written about runs away and drops out of college. From, you know, Ben Franklin to Albert Einstein to Steve Jobs to Wozniak to Zuckerberg to Page, whatever. This is why I don't get asked to give graduation speeches that often. <laughs> but, but when you look at what Steve Jobs wrote in 1997 when he came back to Apple and he said, we got to put an ad on saying, who are we? It was, here's to the misfits, the rebels, the round pegs and the square holes, the ones who think differently. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. And to me, that's the essence of the formula, however you want to apply it with your management style. And we have time for one more, maybe a quick one. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, the, the woman right here in the middle, please. Is it a quick one? Yeah. It'll be right. a quick answer. <laughs> Hello, thank you for your speech. I'm an educator, and as you have touched upon, our education system from kindergarten all the way through college is not conducive to this kind of creativity, to harbor it, to nurture it. It's not, or do you have any suggestions? Yeah, I do, change? and um, this will put me in the optimistic camp, uh, as Lester will be proud to hear, which is, our education system is still, is not the best in the world anymore. It used to be. Our K through 12 system used to be number one in every metric from graduation rates to, you know, math and science scores. We're now about 17th or 20th, depending on how you want to do it. So that's really, really bad for the future. However, we are very good and better than those countries that exceed us in the 
the tables of scores, especially in Asia, at allowing some curiosity, some questioning of authority, people to explore, people not to have things handed down and memorized by rote. That's what we have to keep nurturing, is this ability to get a student, whether it be Steve Jobs or Ada Lovelace or whatever, to say, why? I mean, when Einstein is taught the very first principle of physics from Newton's Principia, that time marches along irrespective of how we observe it, he spends his childhood saying, how would we know that? How would we test that? And you get the theory of relativity. But to do that, he had to run away from the German school system because whenever he questioned authority, that wasn't so good in the German school system. He finally went to a Pestalozzi, like a Montessori school in Switzerland. So make sure that we nurture creativity, the arts, the humanities. That's what teaches us to question and be creative and make sure we nurture kids who are always going to be curious and question. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have time for. Thank you. And Mr. Isaacson will be signing copies.